just wanted to thank the Institute for extending the invitation, um, for welcoming me so, so warmly, and uh, also for um, enabling this conversation about defence to um, continue, the one that's stemmed out of the uh, December summit on defence, uh, because it's often, until recently at least, one of those issues that tends to get <coughs> slightly swept off the agenda um, when economic uh, um, issues um, and the everyday management of the financial crisis are, are on most uh, European leaders' uh, agenda. Um, and I suppose even before what happened uh, a couple of weeks ago, it was already becoming a you know, one of those long-term issues that, you know, defence cooperation that isn't really a long-term issue anymore because it causes a certain amount of short-term headaches. Uh, when we first discussed um, this, this, this talk with the, with the Institute over the phone a few months ago, we, we thought the issue was, was uh, pretty topical, to be honest, because of the December summit. Uh, because, you know, um, in the wake of the summit and in the run-up to the European elections, we thought it might be nice to talk about European defence and European citizens and so on. <clears throat> it <clears throat> comes on the back of 18 months of, you know, pretty serious soul-searching on the part uh, across, the, across the continent, across the capitals, uh, in Brussels as well. And it also comes before, uh, you know, all the intricate negotiations um, uh, about the, the the changing of the guard in in, in Brussels uh, in coming months, which hopefully will bring a, a renewed uh, sense of purpose on these issues included. So we were chatting about this, and you know we thought we were in a pretty good place, and it would be nice to have a bit of a shot in the arm before the European elections uh, and talk about you know citizens' perception of defence and so on. Little did we know, of course, that these issues would be set against a full-blown institutional, uh, a full-blown international crisis, um, sorry, that, that brings basically all these issues now um, to a head and completely to the fore um, in a manner certainly quite unprecedented um, since, obviously, since the European Defence Project came to be and uh, probably for some time before that. Obviously, um, what, what's, what's happening in the Crimea... Uh, throws up some pretty searching questions from Vilnius to, to Lisbon, uh, and and will continue to do so once the um, if you like the dust has has somewhat settled uh, and and um, short term concerns um, about Putin's autism and such uh, stop crowding out the long term ones. Um, I, you know. It's 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 the, the 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 it's the recurrent questions, if you like, about okay, obviously, what what should we do about it? But is is there any way we can agree on what we should do about it? And if we can agree, how do we do? How do we do it? And with what means? Uh, and can we genuinely do it um, together? And I suppose more profoundly, the some of the usual existential questions about European defence, what does it stand for, what do we mean by it, I mean, do we agree on the aims, the purpose, um, what do we want it to stand for? And um, since we're here in, in, in Dublin, I, I noticed this because I, 15-minute um, walk, I got completely poured, uh, the, I got completely drenched in rain, so we must be somewhere near... Dublin. Um, uh, I, I believe it's been pointed out in this in in this very place in these uh, hallowed halls that um, I suppose in this in this um, on this side of the Western world we 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 like to think that the uh, the force of law trumps the law of force. But once you've said that, um, I would tend to ask you know how do you uphold the force of law in the face of someone who clearly has absolutely no interest in doing so. Um, he doesn't necessarily play by the, you know, by the book of, of Western rules. Um, he wasn't part of the, the gentleman's club. 
um, I mean, in this case, is the is the force of law enough to sustain the force of law? Uh, I mean, if provided you're in a you this you're in this side of of the Crimea in a in a in a, in a nice Swiss conference room. I suppose intellectually, it's almost it's almost if you like a picture perfect example of. Um, how we how we conceive of and how we apply um, European European values. So I suppose over here you would ask, um, well, do you uh, sit back? Um, we, we were talking about this a second ago. Do you sit back and assume that uh, Putin is basically shooting himself in the foot in the long term? Uh, invest all you can in the Ukraine. Um, and basically wait for liberal democracy and um, and 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 the market economy to to do their job. He'd basically assume there's a kind of um, bumpy but um, teleological, um, if you like, tendency of other people to want to become more like Europeans, basically, uh, and and somehow embrace Western values. Uh, by dent of Europe's soft power alone. Um, or, you know, are, are the countries that um, actually don't want anything to do with Western value? Um, is, I suppose, appeasement um, tantamount to giving Putin a, a free reign over his over his purported sphere of influence um, do you need a range of other means and other instruments to protect the force of law um, and ultimately does Europe have the means to do so and to deal with such situations um, I mean I know over here um, I, I think we prefer the term uh, crisis management and and, and, and to, to, to you know defense proper which sometimes is um, as, as in a few uh, to be fair a few European countries is sometimes a bit unpalatable and uh, you know obviously it's extremely useful to be able to anticipate and to be able to prevent crises you see that in, in most cases we yeah, we don't really anticipate or are able to prevent them still and obviously it's extremely useful to be able to once the conflict has passed to be able to go in and, and do the you know the tricky work of you know rebuilding the, the justice system rebuilding the security sector rebuilding a state that obviously is something that military force isn't going to enable you to do however in crisis management i suppose you also have the aspect which is basically just managing crisis uh, and um, and sometimes managing a crisis uh, requires other means than um, than, than only um, you know trying to prevent it or or, or trying to rebuild after it. Um, and the question is, does Europe have the requisite tools to manage such a crisis uh, such a crisis at its doorstep? Um, whatever the answers to these questions, I suppose. Um, that what makes a bit of a difference to people um, in, in, in our line of work is that these questions are being asked uh, and um, they're basically they're put on the table. They're, things are being thrashed out at the minute um, because the usual complaint you hear from people like me is that you know, there's no awareness or interest on the part of European citizens and therefore there's no political will to deal with these things. Um, these issues get so very little visibility. Um, people take peace for granted and forget the lessons of, of, of history because prosperity and economic growth have made us forget that you know there's a price to pay for peace, um, so on. That there's uh, no interest on the part of the Brussels institution, the Brussels institutions to to talk about defence. That it's not in their DNA. That they always do too little, too late. Um, and, and when you know, um, when <clears throat> defence analysts have finished moaning about all that, they they then deplore the fact that there's no external threat that would compel Europeans to get their acts together on defence. So 
obviously you see where I'm going with this. Um, on all of these counts, um, I suppose first, it, it's worth noting that <laughs> defence was put on the on the squarely on the table two years ago by Brussels institutions that are supposed to be sort of slow and sluggish. Um, you know, you can hardly complain that Brussels is being behind the curve on defence. Um, before all this happened, um, they'd um, some actually, in, in some respects, quite bravely decided to tackle the issues of, of defence and, and launch the whole process 18 months ago. Um, from there, I suppose momentum has developed. Um, we we have a high level political mandate that emanated from the from the December European Council, the highest possible political level in Europe, which is the heads of state and government. We have a calendar. Um, we know uh, f we know what we want to do and when we want to do it on most on frankly most of of the of the important issues, and uh, obviously these issues are kept on the radar and 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 we're going to tackle them next year at the highest political level in the EU again. So, <clears throat> in a way, I mean, in this respect, you can't really, I suppose, accuse the EU of of of, of you know, being reactive and, and, and being behind the curve, because in this respect, to my mind, we've, we've you know, shifted from the back foot to the front foot. Um, we, we also, of course, have the institutional tools now um, that hopefully this momentum that's been developing has, can help appropriate. Um, we haven't yet appropriated the, 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 the institutional tools of the, of the Lisbon Treaty, um, that we didn't have, for example, when the situation in Georgia broke out, um, and so hopefully, <clears throat> hopefully this 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 dynamic um, can can help um, can, can help us uh, appropriate institutional tools that we actually have but are not using. Uh, last but not least, um, well, there's been this basic Deus Ex Machina, this. In this 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 Crimea um, um, business, and hallelujah, we finally have this long-awaited external threat that people seem to be um, seem to be pining for. Um, um, and what this means, I suppose, is that well, automatically there is a a, a certain uh, level of interest uh, on you know defence matters. I mean, I I was. Um, wandering around this this morning and, and you know it's not it's not just football on the front pages the Crimea is in the headlines um, the, the, there is a keener I suppose interest and, and perception of, of Europe's environment of how if you like it fits into its environment <clears throat> a heightened sense of I suppose the European project how how um, how, how valuable it is because people on the streets fighting for it, and also how fragile um, it is. Um, I, I would, you know, I hesitate to call it this because I don't want to be flippant about it. But it's, it's, you know, I suppose it, I, I would call it wake up and, and smell the raki. <laughs> raki being a uh, well, it's um, it's a, a, an alcohol from the east of uh, Europe. So there's a sense that um, I suppose. Before this, Europe had been slightly, I suppose, navigating a, a strategic mist, um, and 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 it needed to wake up to the world around it, and um, if you like, to its purpose inside it. Um, and and so, I suppose with 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 Crimea, what's happened is I, there's a maybe a heightened sense of. Self, I, I don't know how. To, maybe that's too abstract a way to put it, but <clears throat> a better sense of how 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 uh, of, of of how Europe fits into its environment and 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 um, and, and of what's happening at at its gates uh, and in its neighbourhood. So anyway, <clears throat> long story short, there's a distinct sense here that all these boxes are being ticked. What everyone was mooning about suddenly. Um, all these factors seem to there seems to be a conjunction of these various things. Where, where um, I think the Greek call it kairos. Um, it's basically um, it seems to me that the, the um, all the all the sort of 
like the hurdles that were in front of us when we tried, when we were always pushing for more defence cooperation and, and, and more European defence and for more awareness of the facts uh, by, 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 by European citizens, uh, um, basically um, all, these, all these hurdles are, are somehow uh, fading. I mean, obviously, it's uh, uh, early stages, and we'll see what happens. But um, the the <coughs> the idea then, basically, behind our research, what what's what we were trying to do on European citizens and 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 um, on European strategic cultures and such, was that the day that people were ready to take on these these issues and and to to, to think about a more strategic role for Europe in its environment and in the world. Then you know we'd have some basic facts for them, some reliable data, some solid um, stats that you could draw upon, um, and 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 the, well, when the opportunity arose that all these hurdles might be cleared, that you know uh, you'd at least have some useful empirical um, um, data. And I, I must remind you that um, it's going to depend a lot on, on, I suppose, the personality of the new high representative. But there is in the pipeline uh, a strategic drive, a strategic effort, which isn't going to be. We'll see how it how it works, but and it's not going to happen until the end of this year. But there is a debate that's in the pipeline about Europe's, um, I suppose, ultimately role in the world. So I'll briefly present some of the data we've we've had a look at. Um, which mostly, I suppose, confirms and, and substantiates the, the, the contradictions and divergences that I, meant earlier, uh, I mentioned earlier over Crimea. Um, <clears throat> there are, well, as, 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 as you mentioned, there are several strands of comparative data which we've tried to work on. Um, I'll start with what we found on European citizens, but actually uh, that data also feeds into a, a, a broader effort um, which, if I have time at the end, I'll say a few words about because it's um, it's it's fairly unhelpful to look at these uh, layers or strands in isolation because European defence is a kind of big pyramid of interdependent, I suppose, levers or stuff that um, needs to be considered as a as a whole. Um, so, in terms of, uh, I suppose, what European citizens think about 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 defence, the first astonishing fact that for me because i hadn't i hadn't looked into this data was actually how um i suppose how high and how consistent the support for a common foreign policy and b common european defense actually was um if uh, you have a look at the, at the polls basically the support for common foreign policy is, is anywhere between uh, sixty percent and seventy percent in the last twenty years, <clears throat> so since the end of the Cold War, uh, and the support for common defence policy actually registers even higher, between seventy and eighty percent consistently over the last twenty years. Obviously, with some discrepancy, um, some discrepancy between the uh, member states, which we tried to log in, in, in this in this paper here. Um, you can have a closer look at the at the figures, um, but basically, what we concluded was that um, well, the the numbers. So that's the first conclusion: is that actually the the support is is actually the level of support is surprisingly high. However, when you kind of dig into what that means, um, suddenly things get a bit more complicated. Um, so when you ask whether you know, European citizens want a European foreign policy that's independent of the United States, everyone says yes. And when you ask them, do you want to invest more or cut less in defence, which makes it possible to have a, a more independent foreign policy, people say no. Um, uh, you know, I, I think that's become a bit more apparent over recent months with the cyber scandals and, uh, and uh, you know, it's extremely. Some of this stuff is extremely expensive, uh, and um, unless you have um, drones that don't depend on basically um, American captors or whatever, uh, unless you have independent cyber systems, then you know, um, it's very it's very hard to have a, to lead an autonomous 
um, um, to run an autonomous foreign policy. In the same way, um, when you um, when you when you ask uh, when you ask European citizens and you have a look at the polls, um, everyone thinks that um, an enhanced European uh, security and defence policy would provide Europe with a greater leadership role in the world. So basically, everyone wants a common European security and defence policy. And then, when you ask them if in parallel they would like a common defence organisation which implies obviously that there's I suppose some constraints um, it's not just the policy but there's an actual organisation then suddenly no one wants it anymore so they want the policies but they do want the constraints um, if you ask them if um, we want uh, you know a, a strong strong leadership for, for Europe and world affairs, everyone says yes. We want a, you know, a free, prosperous, powerful uh, European Union uh, that's able to influence uh, um, world events. But then, again, there's some internal variation in, in the figures. I'm just talking about consolidated European figures here. Um, and then when you ask them, well, sometimes are you prepared to... Uh, for example, brandish a, a credible threat of force in order to influence events without necessarily using force, but for example, uh, using force to advance diplomatic means, or uh, sorry, using the threat of force to advance diplomatic means or to make diplomatic um, means credible, then um, there's uh, basically 80% uh, of, of Europeans don't, op op sorry, 80% of Europeans oppose that. So there's, there's a widespread aversion to, to using even the suggestion that you might use force so the way we sum this up was basically saying that um, European citizens are keen to have a common defence but without the associated constraints they're happy for the perks of global leadership to fall their way but without some of the unpalatable responsibilities that, that, that come with it um, they strongly support strategic autonomy but not the costs it might incur um, so, in a few words, um, they, Europeans want, um, in the abstract, they want increased global leadership and increased uh, strategic autonomy but with fewer common means, less investment, no conceivable recourse to force, and no dedicated institutions or structures. So, then it's a case of understanding what, 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 these, what these discrepancies are all about, and um, obviously, I mean, to to a certain extent, um, the, the, there is um, there is a, a lack of awareness of, I suppose, what European defence, um, what defence actually involves, and the costs it it um, it it implies, even just to uh, you know, just to ensuring the conditions of peace and prosperity in a given country, uh, sometimes is is. Uh, uh, that's basically the bread and butter of, of security and sometimes it's it usually even though it's the bread and butter it usually doesn't come cheap um, and one of the figures that we used to show that was that some basically when you ask people uh, what the level of uh, spending for defense is in in their national states some people say 15 percent so i i knew like, w when you look at budgets every day and stuff it seems you know, completely outlandish, considering that um, the I think the only depending on how you count these things, the only country who's got uh, who <coughs> spends more than two percent of GDP on on defence is probably Greece. Um, so, but fifteen percent of GDP is like um, well, it's basically it's 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 enormous. It's about it's of um, seven to eight times what any member state would would spend on defence. Um, so basically there's a sense that well we don't really know what European defence means, what a European or common European policy on defence means, but we would like some of the benefits that's associated with it. Um, and then actually when you when you when you dig further and, and when there is a, a I suppose a, a realization of what it implies, then 
you then you realize that when people know what it implies they don't agree on on it so um the 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 the, the same divergences appear that appear in in crimea for example some some people are <coughs> <clears throat> more interventionist, some people less uh, interventionist, some, some people are more sort of Atlanticist, some people are less so. Um, so, um, so. So basically it's, um, I suppose the, 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 the double aspect the, the, of it is that we don't necessarily always know what it means and when, you, when we do know what it means we don't agree on it. Um, so to, to 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 finish up, um, I suppose I'll I'll, I'll give you um, a, a very very quick overview of of, of of the other strands that we've um, that we've explored in in parallel to this. Um, <clears throat> I, I basically made the the fairly bold and and altogether rather silly assumption that that European defence. It sort of looks like a giant bowl of of lasagna. Um, you know what it is on the outside, but you don't quite know what's what's inside. You can sort of distinguish the the crust, I suppose, which is looks nice. It's I suppose liberal democracy, human rights, uh, market economies, and stuff. Um, and you can distinguish some of the lumps and the layers inside. So you know that at some point Europe drew up a a strategy. For its external action, some people know this. Some people know there's a defence agency that Europe has a defence agency. We're not quite sure what it does, and we're not quite sure what the relationship between, for example, its strategic aims and um, um, how it implements its defence policy is. But we can we 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 know of some people even think that we have a drone army that's piloted by the Commission President uh, Barroso. Um, this is across the channel, so I won't navigate them. Um, but I, I suppose we're not quite sure how all of this holds together, and whether these layers are, um, are hard or soft. If it, you know, we don't know if it's vegetarian or, or, or if there's muscle and meat in there. Um, um, we, I mean, I, this makes me think of a uh, something I read in the paper yesterday. One of the Russians, um, the main Russian newspaper, I think, was calling European sanctions on Crimea vegetarian. <laughs> herbivorous um, and we don't know whether this what's in this lasagna is, is, is herbivorous or, or carnivorous I suppose and, um, and, and, and I suppose when you, when you do know what, what, the, what the ingredients are to make lasagna you, um, I suppose you, you always think you can make a better lasagna you always think uh, everyone thinks they can make the better lasagna if you're whatever in, in the south in the north um, in the um, in the east, um, um, so um, I mean, it, it's, it was quite you know it's quite apparent when it comes to when it comes to Russia. If you talk about this with with poles, they will basically they will tell you about sort of rationing cards and uh, and main battle tanks invading and so on. Um, if you talk European defence with Italians, they will tell you that you know they see ships coming over from Africa and illegal immigration, whatever, um, and if you talk about um, European defence to people in the north, they talk about the Arctic, and if you talk about defence in, in 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 the middle, they'll, they'll talk about. We're not quite sure. They haven't quite decided yet. Um, so, um, anyhow, what, what we set out to do to remedy this this kind of um, confusion and, and establish some of the hard facts was to have a, a kind of a, a careful and detailed look at, at some of these different layers of the lasagna if you like um, I do apologise for the metaphor I, I have more sophisticated ones but I quite like the lasagna metaphor um, so you can there the are basically different, different layers so underneath that crust you'd have like strategic cultures, strategic thinking um, you'd have then perceptions of risks and threats uh, budgets, capabilities, operations, and 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 uh, the, 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 there's the layer. Basically, the, the citizens is obviously the, the the foundational lever in many respects. Um, and um, so, what what we did um, in 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 a few words. Um, so this was a couple of years ago, um, and we we 
um, we looked at um, strategic thinking across European member states. So um, we looked into all member states' uh, strategic documents <coughs> in, in, and broke them down in, in one big uh, database, which basically tells you what each country officially thinks about you know, 30 or 40 issues, which range from proliferation to terrorism to, to uh, cyber security and stuff. Um, I should really have a, a, a nice PowerPoint that I'm a bit of a dinosaur, so I have it in paper form. Um, so we have basically this, this um, if you like, this, this big database about how um, European member states um, see their strategic landscape and what, what are the risks and threats and uh, the, <coughs> actually maybe I mean, yeah, 30 or, or 40 different items and then how they define their strategic objectives in return. Um, and we're, we're currently extending that to uh, India and Russia and Brazil, seeing how, how they support their strategic thinking. From there, we sought to uh, basically draw some conclusions as to the, the different strategic cultures that we have across the EU. And this we did with um, Nick uh, Whitney uh, at ECFR, who was the former head of the European Defence Agency. And we ended up, that's the strategic cacophony um, paper, and we ended up with a kind of map, mapping all these strategic cultures um, um, across uh, the European member states, based, if you like, on the study of their strategic thinking and this this sort of database. I, I hope you don't. I, I hope you can't see, so you can't see where Ireland is, because then I would have to justify it. <laughs> um, and so uh, then, um, then what we did. Um, I think Michael is here. We we, we were we were um, sort of a, uh, last month. We were in a, in a room and we brought. Um, different people from all across the member states brought them to Paris and asked them what, how, how they saw their, um, their regional environments, how they saw risks and threats, um, and s to see if we could thrash out a, 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 common, a common position. Um, with, 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 uh, with Cloda, who's, who's also here, we, we, we looked at, we compiled all the um, member states' defence budgets um, according to, uh, I think for the first time, to be honest, um, according to all the different sources, the main sources, so the EDA, the uh, IISS, NATO and CIPRI, to see some of the divergences and convergences. Um, and again, it's that, it's that wish to sort of um, have some kind of, you know, uh, that European leaders base their decisions on, sort of make evidence-based uh, decision rather than kind of on moral imperatives that Europe you know, should co cooperate more or whatever. Actually, when you look at the documents, when you look at the budgets, it's quite clear that Europe cannot, the member states cannot keep doing this um, in, a, in a, cannot cannot keep, um, if you like, uh, having their defence policies uh, so narrowly, uh, um, so narrowly defined. Uh, and they just, ha they have to cooperate more, not because of a moral imperative, but because they can't afford it anymore. And uh, on lastly, on the operational front, which is the last... Um, um, <clears throat> if you like, layer of the uh, of of the uh, lasagna, um, we we compiled all the for, this is quite interesting all the codes of conduct of, of EU national member states, and it's quite useful to see the different reflexes, the different operational cultures uh, for, for for national militaries, um, um, and uh, we are, we actually asked ourselves. Uh, what would what the code of conduct would be for a, an EU battle group? What would it look like? Uh, one other thing which would be interesting to compare is the mandates for deployment of, of national militaries, um, <coughs> including in a European context, um, and comparing the, 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 the capabilities as countries transform their, their, their militaries. So, <coughs> basically, in, in a word, it's kind of <coughs> brushes, kind of, <coughs> it, it, I suppose it, um, all this is, 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 you know, is a bit uh, sort of empirical, sometimes a bit tedious, but it's, it's fairly novel uh, data, which gives a nice picture of European defence as it actually works, and of the different layers and how they interact or not. For example, how strategic cultures or strategic thinking actually trickles down 
to the different to the to the other other layers to dif to decisions about spending to decisions about operations um, to uh, to decisions about capabilities. Um, so I'm I'm hoping to to make all this more available. I mean it's a work in progress and uh, make it more systematic. Um, see if we can set up a kind of uh, monitoring me mechanism that um, can be updated over time. Uh, and it's just basically so we can get our facts straight about this lasagna that European defence is and keep getting them straight uh, go going, going forward, in particular if you try and draw up a, a strategy um, for Europe. I, the last thing we need is I, I just need to find a name for it. Uh, and to my great everlasting regret, I googled... Uh, lasagna project and it's actually already taken and what it's more it is financed by the European Commission <laughs> google it you'll see <laughs> thank you very much <clears throat>